Hello nerds and welcome to another Civilization 6 Leader Pass Breakdown. Today we are talking about the fourth leader pack that is being released today. It's called the Rulers of the Sahara Pack, which of course includes nice civs like Ramses, the second of Egypt, you may remember from Civ 5, Ptolemaic Cleopatra of Egypt as the alternate persona Cleopatra, and King Sun Diata Kaita from the Mali. All very, very interesting civs, and I'm super excited to get into them. Let's try to talk about Egypt as a whole so we can go ahead and dive more deeply into Ptolemaic, Cleopatra, and Ramses here later down in the video. For those that don't know, most civs in the game have a starting bias. Egypt has a tier 2 floodplain spawn bias as well as a tier 5 river spawn bias. Uh, basically what that means is that they almost always spawn on a river and generally on floodplains. You can see this original Cleopatra uh, has spawned on a river with floodplains, lots of rivers actually, which is really useful for their abilities. Egypt's abilities can kind of be broken down into two parts. The first is 15% production towards districts and wonders built next to a river. Note, this is river, not just floodplains. So for instance, a holy site here on this tile will be built 15% faster but so will a commercial hub on a basic river tile like this. This is a nice little production boost that helps you get your infrastructure down faster and is just generally good no matter how you play Cleopatra, as long as you're trying to settle along rivers. This also applies to wonders. So for instance, if you wanna go ahead and build something like the Hanging Gardens, you do have a 15% production boost, which is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, that is essentially running another instance or of, of Corvée so that you can stack Corvée Autocracy for another 10% production towards Wonders to a total of 40% production towards Wonders uh, on your production queue. And if you combine that with Ground Baker with Magnus, which gives you an additional 50% production on your woods and stone chops, that is essentially a 90% production boost towards a Wonder when you're chopping and 40% on your base production. This makes Egypt a nice Wonder sieve. It's not the strongest Wonder sieve, it helps you get those wonders down a little bit faster. It's not as crazy as Wen Shi Huang of China. It is definitely one of the leaders that has a boost to building wonders, which we will dive very deeply when we talk about Ramses, because holy crap, Ramses' additional ability, very, very good for building wonders. Egypt's second ability is districts and improvements and units are immune to damage from floods. What that essentially does is it gives you functionally a free dam in every single one of your cities. This is great because you're going to want to settle on flip planes in general, but it's there's actually a couple of hidden hidden gems if you look into this a little bit deeper. Uh, you don't have to build a dam, which is a considerable amount of production because it is a district and it scales in production throughout the game. Uh, if, you, if you're not building dams, you're not getting the housing, you're not getting the additional money, and you're not getting the appeal, but you already have the preventing flood damage on rivers by default as Egypt. And you're also not getting the prevention of food loss during droughts for this city, which is actually an ability I completely uh, forgot about. I, I forgot that dams counteract droughts, which is really cool. But dams also do this ability where yields from flood disasters drop by 50%. But basically you get a lot less food on those floodplain tiles every time it, it floods. As Egypt, you're actually able to keep the additional yields from your floodable rivers without having to dam them. So Egypt generally has, you know, as a knot to the Nile, very, very fertile floodplain rivers, almost wherever they settle, which is just uh, a nice little boost and a little bit nod to them as well. Also, if you want to settle on floodplains a lot, that's a you get an additional error score every time you settle on a floodable river or two tiles from one. Just like when you settle next to volcanoes, uh, or if you settle on a desert or a tundra tile. That's a nice little trickle of error score, which is really useful because it, it combines with two ancient era unique units and improvements, which makes getting golden age classical ages very, very easy, which can really help you set up for a really strong game. Generally, the classical golden age is the hardest one to get because you have the least amount of time and units and cities in order uh, to do that. To talk about the unique unit a little bit, we can talk about the Marianu Chariot Archer. This is actually a very strong unit. It gets a bad rap um, because of reasons we'll get into, but it's right here at the wheel. So you can see a little bit more investment than going for archery, but the Chariot Archer itself has two movement base, but it has four movement when it starts in open terrain. So if you're in open terrain, 
It has the movement of a horseman if it's in difficult terrain, and then it's going to have movement of a warrior. But this is something interesting about the chariot archer, that their melee strength is 25. It is actually stronger than a warrior in the melee attack. Given that it's a range unit, this tends to not normally be the case. And their range strength is actually 35. Note, an archer's range strength is 25, and a crossbow is 40. So this is actually almost as strong as a crossbow. In the ancient era, while also being a higher movement and better defense strength unit you know, than the warrior. Chariot archers, they're very strong. They have a couple things that are difficult about them. One is that because they are an ancient era unit, they can't they can't benefit from great generals. Great generals, the very first great general is a classical era general, and they will give strength and movements to classical and medieval era units. There are no generals that buff ancient era units. That's just how the game is. So the Chariot Archer will have to stand on its own. Uh, so that additional 35 strength is, is nice. In terms of playing single player, especially on Deity, you tend to get out teched by the AI very quickly in the early game because they they start with a bunch of free techs and free cities. You can go to rush Chariot Archers, but more than likely you're gonna end up running into a, um, AI swordsmen, crossbows, walls, all things that will definitely hurt a lot in terms of the effectiveness of the Chariot Archer which is why they tend to get a, lot, a bad rap in the Civ community. However, on their own, they're very strong. And if you're playing multiplayer, uh, a Chariot Archer Rush is actually relatively effective. I saw Foibles do this in the Civ give, where he got Chariot Archers very, very early. He was able to defend his tier droughts and also turn them on a sassy gamer lady. They were very strong for how early that you get them. Uh, I believe they're just a little bit more expensive. Um, but you can see here, um, as with any range unit, they have less combat strength when fighting a district's defenses, like walls. They're almost twice as expensive as a heavy chariot and also main and cost two maintenance. Overall, they're a very good unit. They just, they're just not very good against the deity AI, which is why they get a bad rep. And then there is, of course, the Sphinx, which is the unique tile improvement of Egypt. These will give you one faith and one culture and two. This is the only unique tile improvement in the game that provides two appeal now. At one point, the, the Paradeza from Persia actually gave two appeal, but they ended up lowering that to one appeal because it was a little bit strong. The Sphinx, however, still does have the two appeal. And I believe this is because you are generally settling on floodplains, which have a negative appeal. So the Sphinxes have always allowed you to essentially flip the negative appeal of a floodplain to plus one appeal to help you get some neighborhoods on your floodplains. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about the appeal once we get to the Ptolemaic Cleopatra because this is completely flipped on its head. But Sphinxes are really good because they give the one faith, the one culture. They get additional two faith if they're adjacent to a wonder and one culture if they're built on a floodplain. They also get another culture at natural history, which is pretty far into the game. But for instance, if you go ahead and you build the, for instance, a, the Oracle on this hill, this will end up giving you three faith and two culture in the very early part of the game. So you want to prioritize putting them on floodplains next to wonders, but you can spam them as long as they're not adjacent to a, another tile, which can end up creating a ton of appeal in a localized area. I like using them with conjunction in conjunction with national parks because if you put them because if you put them all around a national park all of these sphinxes will give two appeal instead of woods which gives one which you can make a really high appeal national park later into the game and really help with the tourism victory this is a very similar strat to using liang city parks if you've ever used the city park tile improvement this is something that is unlocked at the final promotion of liang these tiles provide two appeal as well as a ton of culture. They're really good at buffing national parks just by surrounding them with city parks. But as Cleopatra, you're able to use this and your Sphinx anywhere in your empire with have, without having to invest deeply into Liang and still get the same bonus and even a better one because your, your Sphinxes will be giving you more culture than the city parks will when you take Liang out of them. Uh, because once you get to flight, you also get tourism based off of the culture on these tiles. Given that every Sphinx at this point in the game will be giving you two culture base and an additional culture and, and three culture if you're on a floodplain, that's that's uh, that's a decent amount of tourism that you can be able to spam around the, around the place. Not bad, not bad, not bad. Overall, Sphinxes are one of my favorite 
tile improvements, um, basically as the appeal mechanic, but that's just me. Sorry. <laughs> But yeah, between settling on floodplains, the Marianu Chariot Archer, and the Sphinx, it is very, very easy to get a Golden Age for the Classical Era, which is very useful for setting up a very strong early game. If we want to talk about the base Cleopatra leader, she gets a little bit of a bad rap, I think, in the Civ community. Her abilities aren't great, but they're... They're not awful either. International trade routes grant plus four gold. Trade routes sent to Egypt from other civilizations provide two food to them and two gold for Egypt. 100% alliance points when trading with allies. This is just a nice boost. This is basically what makes Cleopatra an economic sieve, which any type of economic sieve is, tends to be very general in the way that they play. They can go multiple different directions. When you're trading with another sieve in the early game, that is generally a three gold trade route if all they have is a Cinti Center. That can give you an additional four gold on top of that, which is which is basically doubling your early game trade route income from three to seven. That's not bad. That is not bad. I like to go for commercial clubs very early when I'm playing as Cleopatra to try to get the most of her trade route ability. This also means getting trade partners are very important in the games that you're playing as Cleopatra. Having inter international trade routes are incredibly strong in Civ, especially when you get to the point of the game that you are getting to alliances. Alliances will give you additional yields on top of the extra economy you're making from your better trade routes, including science from research, culture from cultural alliances, additional gold from the economic alliance, and faith from religious alliances. No, the economic alliance here, yeah, four gold from trade routes to your ally and two gold from trade routes from your ally. This is Cleopatra's ability right here. Cleopatra essentially has a level one economic alliance with every civ in the game that you trade with. This is doubled down on the your economic alliance and the 100% alliance points from trading with allies helps you get to your level two alliance even faster. If you're, if you're not familiar, level two and three alliances are actually very strong. For instance, the research alliance, every 30 turns on standard speed, you unlock a Eureka for a tech that your ally has researched or boosted, but you have not. Culture alliances, each of your districts grant additional great person point per turn if you have a trade route from that city to your ally. Economic alliances, bonus envoy point for every city state with your ally as your suzerain. Uh, once you get to level three, which is very possible as Cleopatra, uh, you receive accelerated research on texts that your ally has, but you don't, but also if you're researching the same ones at the same time. Your culture alliance will give you 20% of your allies' tourism from your cities, which is crazy, and 10% of your allies' culture from cities. Economic level three, you share the Susan unique bonus with your ally. Both you and your ally can share like the Geneva bonus together with a level three economic alliance. Cleopatra is a fantastic sieve if you want to play with alliances. You, of course, can also boost those trade routes to your allies with things like Bisselbanken, which will give you plus two food and two production for all for both cities that you're trading with. So between all this, you can get a ton of gold, food, production, science, culture, gold, all of the things you want from your international trade routes. And Cleopatra is one of the best civs to do so. There's also something that happens that's really interesting about playing as Cleopatra. I know whenever I see Cleopatra in my games, I instantly want to try to woo her and be her friend. And it's not just because, you know, waifu, but it is because if I'm able to establish those trade relations with her, those are some of the best international trade outs you can get in the game. I know when I was playing the Civ Give with Foibles, I tried very, very hard to make sure that he was my friend, and I ended up actually being able to be trade partners with him. Uh, he's also a he was also spawned right next to Bose, who was his partner, and it was fantastic because they were able to send international trade routes back and forth from each other and really help out their economies. Um, if they weren't both <laughs> completely erailed by sassy gamer lady from that ridiculous war she waged up to the north while I simmed down in the south. But overall, she's a fantastic AI to try to win over if she doesn't immediately hate you because you're wimpy army. Ooh, ooh. Uh, <laughs> but we're not here to talk about old Cleo. We're here to talk about new Cleo. You'll actually see that the two new Egypt leaders both lend themselves to one portion of the Egyptians' ability. We'll talk first about Cleopatra and then Ramses. But the Ptolemaic Cleopatra, her ability is that resources along floodplains receive one food and one culture. That's just nice. That's that's just nice. Uh, you can see like this wheat tile 
Instead of being a two food, one production tile, it will be a three food, one production, one culture tile um, without even improving it. Of course, you can then improve that with a farm. That becomes a four food tile with production and, and culture. And that becomes really good. It becomes really good. Of course, you can go ahead and stack on top of that. Build a Temenanki. And Temenanki is going to be a very important part of playing Ptolemy Cleopatra because you'll get you get one science and one production on marsh tiles, but you also get one science and one production on all floodplain tiles for this city. So that'll be an additional science and production. That will make this a three food, two production, one culture, and one science tile before you improve it. Uh, same thing with this maze would also be improved. And then all of these all of these tiles would be very, very good. And you'll see that's exactly what they did in the Fraxis live stream. These tiles are fantastic. You're gonna have so much early food and culture and science just from working floodplain tiles. And you're gonna want to go ahead and settle as many of these floodplains as physically possible. Again, why the wetlands map type would be incredibly useful for this type of sieve. I would also try to prioritize building your granaries more so than you would in other sieves because it'll be very important to keep up in housing when you're working so much food. Any other forms of housing will also be useful. For instance, if you're able to get things like the Temple of Artemis and the Hanging Gardens also gives housing in the city that is built. Keep an eye out for these wonders. Uh, also refer to my China video for a in-depth conversation about growth because we went very very deep about how to maximize growth for playing at young lay for ptolemy cleopatra aqueducts are definitely an option you'll build your aqueducts faster however just make sure you're not putting aqueducts on your bonus resources and for instance in your Temenaki city i wouldn't try to aqueduct a tile that has a floodplain on it but if there's another river tile another random fresh water tile that you could aqueduct onto like this one um maybe even this one to i mean it kills a hill but it would preserve production and science on these floodplains those would be very useful to help you get the housing that you need to get to a high population. So will a classical republic government, which will give you plus one housing and one amenity in your cities, these will be incredibly important to try to, to help keep your cities growing. And I think Ptolemaic Cleopatra would like, would prefer classical republic over autocracy for that very reason. Uh, Ramses will be probably the opposite, but we'll get more into him in a little bit. Now, one food and one culture on bonus resources uh, and a little bit of like one tourism on the bonus resources you have. That's not a ton. This first half of the ability, it is, it's fun, but it's not like anything crazy. The second part of the ability is, uh, is kind of game changing in certain ways. The owned floodplains grant plus one appeal to adjacent tiles instead of negative one. So this works just like Brazil's ability to give positive appeal to rainforest instead of negative one. Note, you will have to own the tiles. For instance, this floodplain would be exerting plus one appeal on adjacent tiles, but this one that's outside of my tiles is still exerting negative appeal. In most games, appeal around floodplains is just absolutely atrocious. It's all the way down to negative five in many places, which generally is why I liked to build industrial zones and mines in those areas. And if I'm going for appeal and national parks, putting them in other places that have more natural appeal. Now, Taylor Malik Cleopatra completely flips this on its head. Because you can see right here, this is a negative five appeal tile. It's because there's one, two, three, four, five, six negative appeal tiles next around it. Um, fresh water counts as plus one appeal. So you can see one minus six is negative five. Instead, these will all become positive appeal tiles, and you can chop out those rainforests to make this a plus six appeal tile. That is more breathtaking than this breathtaking tile, and it's more breathtaking than mountains. You can actually make that go even higher now, because the sphinxes will still give to appeal. So this will become plus eight, and then you can put, what, three sphinxes around it? So in a very extreme example, this becomes a plus, this goes from plus six to plus eight, plus 10, plus 12 appeal on this specific tile. During the Firaxis live stream, they made the argument to put your neighborhoods on your floodplains, which of course you totally can do. Um, have those adjacent to your wonders and just, just have super high population and housing because of these breathtaking floodplain tiles. 
But there's also other things you can do, including silly shenanigans you could never have done before, like preserves on floodplains. Of course, this is gonna be my favorite, my favorite thing about uh, the, the new Cleopatra is the option to do preserves on floodplains because these these tiles they're gonna keep flooding throughout the game they'll get food naturally throughout the game on its own then you go ahead and put in a grove which will give you additional two food two faith and culture on breathtaking tiles and then you can also do other shenanigans like arena forestry management will give two gold on unimproved features so you can get additional two gold two food two culture and two faith on all of these breathtaking floodplain tiles, which will have an additional one food and culture from a Cleo's ability. That's really, really awesome. Uh, Reign of Forestry Management also gives plus one appeal to unimproved, plus one appeal to unimproved tiles. Generally, that takes a negative appeal floodplain from negative one to zero. Uh, but with Ptolemaic Cleopatra, it will take it from plus one appeal to plus two appeal. Plus two appeal floodplains will make this so gosh dang high in appeal this would this would be so this goes from what would have been a negative five appeal tile to one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen appeal thirteen appeal before getting eiffel tower for the two appeal here or golden gate bridge in a applicable city that gives four appeal that's a lot and then you can go ahead and you can start national parking your breathtaking floodplain tiles, which will have an incredible amount of appeal. Since appeal equals tourism in national parks, you will end up having some incredible, incredibly impactful national parks on your floodplains. If they are tiles that you're not digging already, right? Like there's gonna be a mix of trying to improve certain tiles, having water mills, and then also starting to district around your rivers, build some wonders around rivers, and then preserving certain rivers and also national parking in other places. I think in the early game, you probably won't be saving all of these tiles specifically next to your capital for all of this appeal. What you might want to do is you can settle a few cities in, for instance, a triangle around so that you can go ahead and get a a really good start on commercial hubs and workable tiles. Maybe you put your government plaza here, actually. And then you, you'll do something similar and then have a really strong uh, center of your empire with a lot of districts and wonders. For instance, you could put things like hanging gardens down and get it some really good theater squares, get it some crazy culture, and then start working on other, on working on appeal in other places. Like right here could be a nice preserve because you'll be able, these, uh, these floodplains are now positive appeal. It kind of just really opens up the game to do some crazy shenanigans in a, a way that wasn't possible before. I don't know if Ptolemaic Cleopatra will necessarily be a good sieve. It's certainly not a broken sieve by any stretch of the imagination, but she does open up a brand new playstyle that isn't available in any other sieve. Just because of that, I think she's a very successful sieve in terms of game design, and I'm so excited to try her out. I think she's definitely less general than original Cleopatra, who is very ec economic focused. And because she's food, culture, and appeal focused, she's definitely leaned a lot heavier into the, the culture victory aspect. I think playing her, you want to try to get the Sphinx down as soon as you can. You want to get a strong early couple of cities. Prioritize building the Itemanaki to really try to get some science to balance out all the additional culture and faith you'll be receiving. Have a good mix of science. Use that culture to get certain milestones like your political philosophy, feudalism, and all the way down to things like your natural history and conservation civics. In terms of science, you're going to want to try to play into uh, early, early wheel. You could try to go for a, a Ruhr Valley, which has to be on a river to give you additional production anyways. Though you might want to also avoid the negative appeal of mines and IZs. Get to flight so you can get to tourism for your sphinxes as early as you can, as well as computers for that tourism boost. Things like Eiffel Tower will also help you with your national parks, as well as that Golden Gate Bridge. Neighborhoods definitely have a place with the new Cleopatra as well. You're going to have so much food, you're going to need the housing, get a crazy population, 
be able to really exert your loyalty pressure on other cities next to you. And because you have a neighborhood anyway, you might as well go ahead and look into playing around with the biosphere because you're gonna have a neighborhood on a river. You might as well build this as well because it'll give a plus one appeal to your rainforest and marsh in addition to your floodplains. Almost every single tile that you own will be exerting positive appeal and you'll just have crazy, crazy appeal everywhere. Again, only save in the game that every single feature Rainforest, marsh, and floodplains will all be giving appeal. Not even Coupe and Bull Moose Teddy can do that. That's, that is, that is so fantastic. Now, while Telemate Cleopatra opens up a brand new playstyle, all centered around having fantastic districts and improvements on floodable tiles, Ramses focuses very heavily on the wonder production side of Egypt. You can see here the leader bonus of Abu Sabel. Receive culture equal to 15% of the production cost after completing any building and 30% after completing any wonder. That is short, that's simple, that is sweet, and a holy crap, that's a lot of culture. This is a, there's gonna be a lot of background math happening here, but we're gonna go ahead and do some of the math here right now. Let's look at the cheapest building in the game, the monument. The monument is 60 production. If you take 15% of that, that is nine culture per turn you get immediately when you build the monument. Remember, when you first settle a city, you're making essentially 1.2 culture per turn. This goes up by 0.2 for every population you have, and uh, you're only getting that one culture because of the palace itself. The real start to culture is your mana. It's, you're gonna have like one, maybe three, and maybe if you will have like five culture per turn, if you have two cities with monuments. Nine culture is a lot. <laughs> Nine culture is a lot. Coda loss is 20, foreign trade is 40. Early empire is 70. Assuming that you're also boosting these, that's gonna help you fly down this civic tree. Let's also look at the next buildings. Let's look at the granary. The granary is 65 production. 65 times 0.15 is 9.7. That's almost 10 culture per turn. If we look at the water mill, that's 80 production. 80 times 1.5 is 12 culture per turn. If you look at the library, if you build an early library, that's 90 production. That's 13.5 culture per turn as soon as you build one. Your markets are 120 production. That's 18 culture whenever you finish a market. That is a, that's a very nice trickle of culture that just helps you out throughout the entire game. If you're familiar with Ayutthaya, this is quite literally the suzerain bonus of Ayutthaya, which gains culture equal to 10% of the production cost of when finishing buildings, but times another 50% of Ayutthaya. If you're able to stack Ayutthaya as a suzerain on top of Ramsey's ability, you'll be getting 25% of the production cost of a building converted into culture. That is insane. That is so much, that is so good. Every time you build one of these buildings, boom, 15 to 25% culture. It's gonna help you fly through these trees. The second part is building those wonders. Let's, for instance, let's look at Etemanaki because we were talking earlier about how good Etemanaki is with Egypt. And it's also one of the earliest wonders in the game, which means it's one of the cheapest. This is 220 production. If you take 220, multiply that by 30%, that is 66 culture. 66 culture is almost the entirety of state workforce or early empire. That is so much in the early game. If you're working on drama and poetry, drama and poetry is 132 culture. But if you build the Itamanaki, that gives you the boost to drama and poetry, which is 40%. So 132 times by 0.6 is you only need 79 culture left. And when you build the Itamanaki, boom, you almost finish drama and poetry in one turn. You know what does finish the it in one turn? The Oracle. The Oracle is 290 production. So if you go ahead and build the Oracle, you'll get an immediate 87 culture, which is plenty, plenty to finish the rest of drum and poetry after it's boosted and then go into the next civic. It is so much culture. You're gonna want, with Ramses, you definitely wanna try to build as many early wonders as possible to try to fly through this civic tree. So if you can build a Temnaki, great. It'll help you get a science. Um, to try to keep up with how fast your your culture is flying. You can go for Oracle for a nice early boost. Uh, you can also go for Oracle. You can go for the Colosseum. You can go for you can go for any wonders that you feel might help, even if the wonder itself isn't that beneficial for you. If it's cheap and no one's building it, 
You could build it and just get a boost to culture. Colossus is a wonder that is very often not built. It is 400 production. I often see this late into the game not being built. That's a free 120 culture. That's just nice. That's that's so nice. 120 culture is almost all of political philosophy. That's <laughs> like you can fly so fast in this game through the culture tree. I think Ramses. I think Ramses has a lot. Uh, a lot of alignment with a Civ like Pericles. You get 5% culture per city state Greece has suzerainty over, especially in single player. You can really stack this like crazy and have an absurd amount of culture. And you can play either into the culture game or to a science game and just use this culture just to like get the culture that you need for a science game for governments. I think Ramsey plays very, very similarly. The 15% production you get towards wonders can be applied to cultural wonders, it can be applied to science win wonders applied to diplo or religious wonders whatever wonders you want this is incredibly useful uh, and he's he's very flexible given the game that you're in if you have a game that has a super strong cultural defense like russia maybe you give it for a science victory um, but if you don't have those cultural defenses maybe you just go ham and go for a super super fast culture win you have a lot of options with ramses now i think there's a few things as Ramses, you want to keep an eye on. One is great engineers, especially if you get someone like Emotep in the very beginning. Emotep gives 175 production towards wonders constructed, but you double if the wonder is the ancient and classical era. You know what this is really good for? <laughs> you know what this is really good for? The Colosseum is only 400 production. That means Emotep gives you 350 production towards that. If you go ahead and combine Corvée, for 15% production, plus you put the wonder, like let's let's say for instance, you wanna put Colosseum on a river tile like this one. You need 400 production. If you, this will give you 15% production if it, because it's on a river, you can get an additional 15% production. You can get additional 15% production because of Corvée. And you get additional 10% production if you're running Autocracy. So very early into the game, you'll get an additional, you'll get that additional 40% production towards Wonders, which means Emotep <laughs> gave 350 production, now gave, gives 490 production towards Classical Age Wonders. I don't think there's a single Classical Age Wonder in the game that's more than 400 production. Terracotta Army, Petra, uh, Mahabodhi Temple, yeah, it's 400 production. You can one turn any single wonder you want in the classical age with Emotep and all of these bonuses. Now, before you do that, please use Emotep on a Mausoleum. We'll give your great engineers an additional charge, which means you can one tap build the Mausoleum. Then you can go back and one tap build the Colosseum. Yeah, so Emotep starts with two charges. If you have three charges, you'll be able to one tap three wonders in the classical era. So you can build a mausoleum, then Colosseum, and you can one tap Mahabodhi Temple or the Great Lighthouse or Petra or the Colossus. Any of these wonders that you want, they're all so incredibly, incredibly quick to build. If you're if you know how to utilize your cards together, this will be a a, a mad amount of culture, a mad amount. These are 400 production. That's at 120 culture three times in a row. If you're able to stack all of these Emotep charges, 120 times three is 360, which is the amount of culture you need for feudalism. That's insane. That's insane. That's so much culture. That's so good. Oh my gosh, we didn't even talk about Monument to the Gods yet. That's another 15% production to Ancient and Classical Era Wonders. Oh my goodness. You could choose this or you could choose another Pantheon that might give you yields throughout the rest of the game. But especially prior to getting your... Maybe Monument to the Gods is really good if you want to go for Temenaki specifically uh, or Oracle because you generally want to go for those before you have access to Corvée and or Autocracy. So maybe Monument to the Gods is still a really good pickup here. That being said, if you want to have access to these great engineers, you're going to want either Faith, you're going to want either Faith or Gold so that you can Gold buy or Faith buy them. Um, or you do you want a, a couple of Industrial Zones? Uh, you don't need to really worry about dams as much because you don't have those 
floods that are coming, but you could build them for the sake of adjacency. But what you really want is you want the great engineer points so that you can get tons of wonders. So you'll definitely want to keep out for certain cards, uh, specifically invention at humanism, because this will give you four engineer points per turn plus two engineer points per turn for every workshop you have. This can turn into a lot of very early great engineer points right at the start of the Renaissance era. So after you got Emo Isidore in Emotep in the medieval era from Faith, probably, you run Invention from here, and then you just go ahead and gobble up the rest of the Great Engineers from the couple of industrial zones you've built. We get, which gets it even crazier once you get to Nuclear Program, when you can also get Scientist Points and more Engineer Points. You get two Engineer Points for every factory and four from every power plant. You know the other good thing about Ramses is that we asked during the Firaxis livestream if gold buying buildings also gives you the culture boost because generally uh, you would think that it wouldn't, it would only be building them. But in fact, this actually does work. Gold buying does give you culture as well as producing them. This is absolutely incredible because as soon as you settle a city, you can just start buying buildings and just boosting your culture tree just further and further along. Imagine the, the example earlier when we built a Temenaki and you boost drama and poetry and then we had almost enough culture to finish drama and poetry, then you can just buy a monument and a granary here and there and then end up finishing the rest of the, of the civic. You could even try to work on two civics at the same time. You, if you wanted to, you could work one turn into a uh, one civic you can switch to another, buy a couple monuments, move it along, and then we'll come back to working over here. That seems like an incredible micro, and I need a very specific example for when that'd be useful. But I think some of the multiplayer CPL community might actually have a lot of fun with that type of micro. Like, that's 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 insane. It's like using Quinchi Huang to build two wonders at a time. Ramses could work on two civics at the same time. That's that's so that's so crazy. Apparently, this works when you also get buildings for free. So, for instance, if you built the Toya de Belém, you get a free monument every time you settle a city that is not on your capital's continent, which means you would just get that extra little boost of culture as well. You'll get that extra nine little culture every time you settle on a new continent. This is pretty far in the in the game, but it, like it's just it's just fun to think about. It even works for building replacements. So, for instance, if you had built monuments, let's say in like three cities and then you decided to pick Void Singers. Not only did you get the boost of culture every time you built a monument, but when you replace that monument with Old God Obelisks, you will also get an extra little boost of culture. I, I still need to test this, but based off of things that we've heard from other types of mechanics in the game, I think this should work. I think this should work. That's, that's so niche as well, but it's just hilarious. I would suggest trying to settle your cities early and getting those your district's place so the cost of the districts doesn't go up too fast as you speed through the culture tree and then once you have a good amount of cities then you can crank out all the buildings all of the wonders all of the districts that you want and just have an absolute blast playing this civ and after ramses we gotta talk about the last leader of the pack who is actually a leader of the mali empire king is sandiaita kaita so let's first talk about Molly. Molly is actually one of my favorite civs in the game because they have such an incredibly different playstyle. Most of the time you're trying to settle to maximize the amount of yields on the tiles that you're settling. However, Molly will settle in the middle of the desert when there are absolutely no yields because they have other ways to get those yields. Your city centers actually gain faith and food for every adjacent desert tile and desert hill tile, that, which does encourage you to settle literally in the middle of the desert. Your mines don't receive the plus one production, but they do receive plus four gold. And you may purchase commercial hub buildings with faith and negative 30% production towards buildings and units. So it's really, really interesting here. Here's an example. We actually have a coastal spawn, but you can see here because we settled next to four desert tiles, we now have four food and four faith per turn from the very start of the game. This is fantastic because it also gives you first pick for pantheons. And since you were going to be so heavily in the desert, desert folklore is almost always the choice that you want to go for. Plus one faith from every adjacent desert tile, which means you can almost always guarantee plus six holy sites, which will you will then be able to use theology to be able to double the adjacency bonus for those holy sites. I generally like to go for a work ethic as well. 
to turn that adjacency bonus into production. This actually gives Molly a very good source of production that he would normally not have and still needs. Because because if you look at Molly's ability, this negative 30% production toward, is only towards buildings and units. You can still use that production at 100% capacity for districts, uh, including your Suguba and your Holy Sites, as well as Wonders. You can even use it on uh, city projects, so things like spaceport projects and stuff. You can end up you can end up going for a science victory, a culture victory, or you can go for a straight domination victory or faith. He's relatively flexible. He's he's very flexible because his main his main yield is gold and as well as faith. You generally want to try to put your Sagubas next to your holy sites as well because they get a major adjacency for being next to those holy sites. And if you're able to place a couple of cities around, you can go ahead and, for instance, you could settle here and you can get more holy sites next to more Sagubas and just get an incredibly good, you'll get incredibly good adjacencies for your holy sites, which these will be plus eight now. And then these Sagubas being plus five uh, they're just absolutely fantastic because you get plus two per holy site they're next to. So if you're able to group all your districts together, you'll have a, a very, a very fast economy. Generally, you end up having a very low amount of science and culture in the early game. And that's totally fine because the, the less science and techs you have, the easier it is to build your districts that will scale with your highest tech or civic. So focusing on gold and faith early in the game actually kind of helps you out uh, and you can slowly build the couple of cheap districts that you need to really get the game rolling. But that, again, that work ethic really helps speed up this process quite a bit. You can then also use, you can also use the faith that you're accumulating to buy your markets and then also and, and get trade routes incredibly quickly. Your Saguba is a half cost commercial hub, which is really, really useful. It has adjacency with the holy sites in addition to the rivers, and they're just incredibly fast to get online. When you're playing Matsumusa, especially when you're playing against the AI who don't generally build a lot of commercial hubs, you end up having so many great merchants. It's absolutely insane. And then your Mentendekalu Calvary are a fantastic knight replacement. They prevent your traders within four tiles from being plundered, but they also give gold equal to 100% of the base combat strength for each defeated enemy unit. They have a higher combat strength than the knights, and they're just, they're fantastic. This is really nice for a knight push part of the way through the game, right here at Stirrups, which you can go ahead and conquer a couple neighbors very quickly with these incredibly fast units. And Mansa Musa's specific ability is international trade routes gain one gold, for every flat desert tile in the origin city and you gain one trade route capacity every time you're in a golden age this makes him as one of the richest sieves in the entire game <laughs> very much for sure having those additional trade routes and also the additional gold per trade route is just incredibly useful for getting your game rolling so let's go ahead and see what is replaced in the the new Malian leader, Sundiate Kieta. And honestly, I'm, I'm incredibly impressed. I'm incredibly impressed. It's all about great people and great works of writing. Patronages of great person cost 20% less gold. Markets gain two slots for great works of writing and great works of writing grant four gold and two production. This is incredibly useful. That That's just, that's really cool. That's, I, I like that. You'll note that, uh, the, the first great writer is only about a thousand gold. So it's, it's generally relatively easy to buy them. And you don't even need to make sure you have Theodos Grace to put the great works in, as you can put them directly in your Sagubas. Not only that, the, the extra golden, specifically the production that you get from great works of writing will help you in your early game, get your cities online. So you want to try to get this as soon as you can. Note the great person patronage is only 20% less gold, not faith. If you want to get your great people discounted with faith, you can go ahead and build the Oracle, which is actually 25% less faith, uh, which also increases the great people in general. So I think getting the Oracle is still very, very useful for this sieve because you're going to be getting a lot of great people no matter what. So this will help you get a lot of merchants. And once you start getting your theater squares online, help you get the great writers, artists, and musicians that you want. I think the Oracle especially is would be especially useful in the capital because most of your cities are going to be focused on building their holy sites and the Sugubas. It's not they're not going to be able to build theater squares for quite a while. However, your cities will grow pretty quickly, especially if you have a lot of desert tiles in your capital. 
So getting an early Theater Square and also building Oracle in it, and then doubling down on getting Grants with Pangala to get an additional 100% great, great People points in that city would really help lower the cost of these great writers as you go to buy them with gold or with faith. Also, having the flexibility to use gold or faith ch for cheap to get great people will help you get a lot of a lot of uh, basically anything you want to the game. You can go ahead and get an early Isidore. You can get another. You can get some great engineers to get some very fast wonders built very quickly because you don't have a ton of production on your tiles specifically. Or you can get a quick scientist here or there. Uh, basically, anytime you need to boost a tech or a civic, you can pretty much just get them whenever you want. Hey, I need an artist this turn. Okay, cool, buy it. Hey, I need a merchant this turn. Never mind, that happened a long time ago. Hey, I need a scientist this turn. Okay, cool, I'll just buy it. The, you have so much flexibility by focusing entirely on your two economies, as opposed to science and culture, that you end up getting so many cities, so many districts, so much gold, you have so much flexibility, and then in the mid game, you absolutely explode. You will absolutely explode in the rest of the districts as you go ahead and get those down. And you are gonna be able to buy so many great works, especially from the AI as well. If you if you can't happen, if you, if you can't, do you happen to miss any of the great works, you can also very easily buy them from the AI. We sell them for probably way too cheap. And this is just really, really cool. So I think if you want to run this new Malian leader, I think going for the Oracle very early in the game will definitely pay off in dividends in your government plaza. I generally, this depends on how many cities that you will want. Ancestral Hall, you're not going to get the 50% production boost to your settlers because you're going to be buying your settlers instead however free builders still good um unless you literally have no tiles and improve because you it's desert uh unless you have nazca in the game definitely try to get nazca nazca will single-handedly just help your desert tiles explode by giving you food and faith and production on your flat desert tiles they also give you appeal so they can actually have fun doing national parks in the desert I've had quite a bit of fun with doing it. Nazca line national parks. It's quite a good time. I would try to go for drama and poetry here relatively early. The literary tradition card, you can actually slot into one of your governments to give you two great writer points per turn, even before you're, you're ready to build theater squares. That way the cost of this great writer will just slowly tick down turn after turn because uh, you only need 60 great writer points. So. Technically, that card alone will get you a great rider in 30 turns, or you can play it, you could run it for about 10 turns and get a third of the cost of the gold of the rider down, and then you'll be able to plug those great works into your markets. Definitely go ahead and go for your your holy sites and your Sagubas. Those are the two early districts you want to build. From there, it depends on the city uh, next to some wonders. You could definitely go for pyramids because you will have so many desert tiles. Why not? Why shouldn't you have it? This is just always a good wonder. Of course, you have to build the Petra. You are, you are obliged to if you're playing as the Mali. Just getting so much additional food, gold, and uh, production on your desert tiles in that city is absolutely fantastic. I love combining the Petra with the Rur Valley as well. Petra, Hill, Mine, Rur Valley cities are actually stronger than regular mines. It's absolutely fantastic to play with. But before that, probably go ahead and get your, your Mamluks, which you can actually rush relatively efficiently. This will help you go ahead and go to war with your enemies and do a lot of pillaging and steal a lot of gold by killing units as well. You could definitely run Merchant Republic for 10% gold in all cities or Theocracy to get the 15% faith discount. This definitely depends whether or not you are running the... This kind of depends on your specific setup. Do you feel like you have more, more gold per turn? Do you feel you have more faith per turn? Both of these are very, very good choices. And then if you want, like this specific game would be a fantastic game to build Toy de Blem because my capital is on my on the coast. So international trade routes from this city receive two gold for every luxury resource at the destination. I could go ahead and build a harbor here if I wanted to build a the Tor Double M. And then international trade out in this direction will help me give me additional gold. We even have pastures. Oh my goodness. Hang on. This is a Great Zimbabwe start as well. So if you want to build the Great Zimbabwe, it'll give you a free trade route capacity. Trade routes from this city give two gold for every bonus resource within three tiles of the city in the city's territory. 
adjacent to oh it has to be adjacent to cattle not cheap anyways and if this was a cattle tile a great zimbabwe is also a really nice wonder to try to build so would the colossus so would the colossus because it's just another uh, trade route this of course does require harbors i might avoid going up here towards the harbors altogether and focus entirely on sagubas but there's nothing wrong with doing a a, a cheeky saguba harbor city with reina in it because reina forged harbor mass reina harbor mass will double your bonuses of your commercial ups and your harbors so if i had a rain city i would never feel bad about putting a harbor and a commercial hub in the same city because then this becomes a plus 10 commercial hub and this becomes a plus six harbor there's that is that is very very good you should i say monster musa is kind of open-ended how you want to finish the game he just has so much gold but this new Kayeta has a definitely a tendency for going for all the great works. So I think he leans a little bit more towards the culture victory than someone else would. Try to get as many great works as slot. Usually I would say go for wonders that give you as many great work slots as possible. Things like the the Apadana, the Great Library, you know, Broadway and Bolshoi. Though I think you'll have so many great work slots between your markets and your theater squares. You don't necessarily need to prioritize these nearly as much. I think the Great Library library would be useful because you will have some pretty weak science and culture in the early game and getting those free boosts for everything in the ancient and classical era will help you keep up as well as giving you free by like boosting all the things that you probably won't be boosting as well as giving you free tech boost throughout the game every time someone gets a great scientist since you probably won't be building a ton of campuses and the ai loves the great scientists yeah, Oxford University also has great works of writing. So that's a, that's another example of something you can build. Also, uh, this is actually really important. Not all great writers are the same. So if you go ahead and go down the list, you can see we have lots of great writers here. You can see there's a, what, six from the classical era, four from medieval, five renaissance, five industrial, six modern, two atomic, and two informational. This is, this is like, yeah, okay. But there's a couple of great writers that actually give double the culture and tourism than the other ones do. Most great works of writing only give two culture and two tourism. However, look at these, the ones the ones that have number one ones on them. Available at the Babylon Pack, great works created by this great writer yield an additional two culture and tourism. If you see Valmiki in the classical era, try to prioritize that person. Let's see who we have here. Yeah, we have Ovid. If this was Valmiki, this great work of writing would give us double the culture and tourism. So you may want to keep an eye out. If you see one that is better than the others, you might decide that you want to go for it as opposed to a normal writer, which you know, you might just have a little bit more extra time to go for. But it's Valmiki of the classical era. It's Rumi of the medieval. Beatrix Potter of the modern era and Gabrielle Mistral of the information era. These are great writers you definitely want to keep an eye out for. Again, early game, there's only two of them. Unlikely that it will be the first one up, but it's just something that to keep an eye out for and something I didn't know for a very long time. But all in all, I'm very, very excited. I, I'm very happy with all three of these new leaders. They all play very heavily into my culture focused play style. So I think they're all very exciting. Also, especially Cleopatra. Actually, there might be one more thing that's really interesting about Cleopatra, so bear with me. Uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about coding, but this this is actually incredibly interesting to me. Uh, as you can see here, I have a Bull Moose Teddy game. Now, of course, Bull Moose Teddy gets culture on all of his breathtaking tiles, which is fantastic. We also know that at flight, all tile improvements that provide culture will also start generating tourism based off of that culture generated. So things like the Sphinx, things like the Great Wall, things like Alcazars, any type of tile improvement will generate tourism. Uh, and this also actually works for things like Gaul's Mines and the Pantheons for pastures and plantations. This is all a well-known well well-known mechanic, right? But we know Bull Moose Teddy doesn't get the tourism on, of course, his unimproved tiles, because that would be absolutely bonkers. And he doesn't get them on lumber mills as well. This is a tile that has culture because it's breathtaking, but it's not generating culture itself. So it's not supposed to generate tourism. However, you'll see something right here where we have a uranium mine that is generating tourism. So is this plain mine here. So is this pasture. So is this plantation. This pasture is generating tourism and so is this pasture. Now I thought you were only supposed to get the tourism off of these tiles if you had the Pantheon. 
or if it was an entire improvement that generated the culture. However, it appears that Bull Moose Teddy's tourism does generate off of tile improvements if it happens that somewhere else in the game it is coded that that tile improvement should activate tourism. So we know that plantations will generate tourism based off of the goddess of plantations pantheon. We know the goddess of open sky that plantation will turn on culture and tourism to pastures. We also know the gall when they get culture on their mine tiles, they will generate tourism from them. It appears that Bull Moose Teddy also gets these tourism if the tile happens to be breathtaking, generating culture, and is activated somewhere else in the game. However, it didn't work for things like Maze, because there hasn't ever been a tile improvement. Uh, it hasn't worked for things like wheat that don't generate culture somewhere else. However, now culture is generated on bonus resources or any resource that is on a flood t floodplain tile. So either Bull Moose Teddy should also start getting tourism on wheat and maize, or it will only happen on floodplain tiles. This is something I would love to test as, as soon as the DLC comes out. But uh, it's it's a funny little quirk of the game that I feel like the majority of people don't know about. So I thought I would share. So if you thought that was interesting, let me know. <laughs> and uh, if you want to play some Volbo's Teddy now, uh, do it. But yeah, what is your opinions of some of these new civs? I think I'm reserving my final opinions until I actually get a chance to play all of them. But I'm very happy with how they appear to have turned out. And I can't wait to give them a try. But I will be playing them on my Twitch channel if you want to go ahead and hang out there live uh, at Wet and Nerdy TV. I stream here every Monday, Wednesday, and sometimes Fridays. If you guys would like to hang out, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, US. I'd love to have you there and to chat. And uh, if you don't know, I do streams of these packs where we live stream the initial discussion of what our initial reactions to these leaders are. And this video is basically a compilation of those thoughts. So if you want to be a part of it there, feel free to join the Twitch channel. Also go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe down below. Please comment to the Pantheon of Algorithms to help boost this along. And uh, cause it is a substantial amount of work putting all of this research and compiling all of my thoughts together. But for those that enjoyed, if you learned something, if I missed something, please comment down below and I will see you in the next video.